A Valuable History Lesson, for the Brits and Everyone Else. March 6, 2020 by Anna Von Reitz. To begin with, you have to know what a commonwealth is and the roots of the institution, essentially, the king gave the church grants of commonwealth land, typically waste land, swamps, gravel pits, sour ground, peat bogs, etc., that the Roman Catholic Church then developed into any useful and gainful purpose to provide benefit to the community and provide support for the poor and the sick. Thus a partnership between the monarch and the church developed, the monarch relieved of the burden of both the wasteland and the poor, the church enriched by the potential resource and the labor of the paupers. This basic relationship between the monarch and the church was inverted under King John. He was called Blacklands because his father basically disinherited him in England and didn't give him any land of his own. The church stepped in to help him overcome this by offering him control of the church's commonwealth lands. This way, the monarch became the servant of the church, but he also regained control and ownership of title in trust to land. This is the relationship that has endured all these centuries, with the church being the donor of the commonwealth trust and the king being the trustee and the poor and sick being the beneficiaries. In the British system, then, you are enrolled as a pauper when you are a member of the Commonwealth estate, and your assets both public and private are considered possessions of the Pope's trustee, to be held and used, for the common good, of the, community served, that is, the paupers who form the body of this public charitable trust. This is a form of, Christian communism, and it used to affect only the dregs of society, those properly identified as paupers and dependent on actual payments or stipends or food, housing, and hospitalization by the church. It was under this system that the church working with the monarch developed poor houses, orphanages, work homes, public works, hospitals, public schools, and many other institutions with which we are now all familiar. The Commonwealth was the first public-private partnership. While retaining the basic quid pro quo, the mechanisms of the Commonwealth changed in the 1600s after the Great Fire of London, during which a new and very lucrative scam was developed, with the best of intentions albeit. In the wake of the Great Fire, chaos reigned and nobody knew what happened to the former owners of surviving property, nor did they return promptly after the inferno. Many simply removed to the countryside or joined relatives in other places. Some property was permanently vacated and had to be raised and cleaned up and cleared using funds from the king, by which he obtained an interest in the grounds. The Sestui Kvi Act of 1666 created a form of false registry in which everyone not present was presumed dead, this was done as a means of moving forward and always with the admission that the owner might in fact show up and reclaim his property. This mechanism allowed the king to claim private property and redevelop it as he and his silent partner, the church, saw fit, and reinvest the profit from this, also as he saw fit. In this way vast amounts of property in the city of London were reclaimed from private ownership and used to enrich the monarchy, which then hired the British crown to manage and develop the property for the public good. The modern municipal government was born. The church remained the donor, with actual control of all the assets, the king remained the trustee, and the poor, sick, and indigent remained the beneficiaries. If the church found the king doing anything it didn't like, it could simply revoke the donation of the trust assets in question, but otherwise, the monarch remained their willing ranch hand and the public budget of the government burgeoned as the British crown got more and more actively involved in procuring revenue under this arrangement. This initial circumstance proved so very profitable, that soon it was being used to seize upon the estates of any missing person and to confiscate private property of foreigners and various other targeted individuals, bankrupts, tax cheats, and so on, with the British Crown providing the revenue agents and warrant officers, being overseen by the Inquisition, to keep them honest ha, 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 and the king being enriched by all the titles to property and his government receiving its due portion of the lucre generated by this activity. In this way, gradually, over time, the king re-established a claim to the land even if it was not true possession, only ownership, that is, a proprietary interest in the land as trustee, and was then able to re-introduce property taxes on the British people that would not have been possible under the original land grant to freeholders established under the Norman patents. King James Chapter 1 wrote a book about this scheme called The Bounty Book and he noted that it all begins with a system of false registration, in this case, registering property as belonging to unknown or missing persons or people merely presumed to be wards of the state. 
This system was shut down by our ancestors, but regained a foothold in modern times under the auspices of Queen Victoria, who put a twist on it, and found a way to glom onto the value of the British people's labor, as well as to continue to convert their land holdings into taxable trust property. This process was called enfranchisement and it pretended to offer people the benefit of being able to vote without explaining that this resulted in losing the ability to elect public officials. By registering to vote, yes, another false registration process, the victims unwittingly incorporated themselves as shareholders in bankrupt public corporations, which then seized upon their assets including their labor as objects to tax. The enfranchised voters were enfranchised in exactly the same way as the McDonald's Corporation offers franchises to operate hamburger shops, all without full disclosure, of course. In this way the Queen was enabled to impose income taxes on living people, under the false presumption that they had knowingly, willingly, and for their own benefit invested in bankrupt corporations chartered by the Queen, and were obligating themselves to pay for the debts of those failed corporations with a tax upon the profits of their individual corporate franchises. Thus, the British voters were imposed upon to pay for public bankruptcies of the Queen's corporations, and their land and labor was mortgaged to do so. Thus there were now two false registry systems in play, one to seize upon land holdings and put them into the Commonwealth Trust, and one to seize upon the value of an individual's labor and impose taxes on that private property, also. This has resulted in a system of what I call corporate feudalism in which the people are being bilked and enslaved by their own government, and the government is sharing the profits of this activity with the Pope, who, together with his organization, is benefiting from the unjust enrichment along with the Queen and the British Crown. We now know what has been practiced against us all, and it is only a matter of what we are going to do about it. Please consider making a small donation to help support Anna and the Living Law Firm, by visiting the American States Assembly.net, scroll to the bottom and click on the Donate Now button. Thank you. If a donation is not possible, please create topic-specific playlists and share this important information with your social network. Thank you.